Okay, ready for this. We are diving into a real prophet, the great rewards of welcoming prophets and the prophetic today by Tony Francis. Ooh, that title. It doesn't mess around, does it? Not at all. This book is all about the incredible blessings that come from welcoming prophets. Okay, I'm intrigued, but I have to admit the whole prophet thing can feel a little, you know, hmm, mystical. A bit like something from a bygone era. I hear ya. But this book brings it right into the here and now, focusing on the real, tangible impact that prophets can have. Like, check this out. One of the first things that struck me was this idea of prophets bringing unity, and not just between people, but between us and God. Unity. Now, that's something I think we could all use a little more of these days, right? Right. And the author connects this idea to a passage in Luke where Jesus talks about being rejected in his hometown, mm -hmm. basically saying that rejecting a prophet, even if they bring a message of blessing or unity, it's like rejecting the message itself. Oh, wow. So it's not just about the person, but about what they carry, the message they bring. Exactly. And it gets even more intense. There's this line, and I'm quoting here directly. Jesus says, Behold, your house is left to you desolate. Whoa. Okay, that's that's pretty heavy stuff. Right. Talk about consequences. Yeah, and you know, it makes you think about what desolate really means. It's not just about a physical building being empty. It's about a spiritual emptiness, a void where God's presence should be. It's like that feeling of being totally disconnected, lost, adrift. Exactly. And the author really emphasizes how without that connection to God, a life, a church, a whole community, it can become barren, like totally totally unfruitful. Okay, so let's say someone's listening to this and thinking, all right, this whole welcoming prophets thing is intriguing, but what does that even look like practically? Like, how do I actually do that? Well, the author uses a great example from the Old Testament, the story of the widow of Zarephath. She's the one who offers the prophet Elijah food and water, even though she's struggling to survive herself. Oh yeah, and that's where the story gets really wild, right? Yeah, right. Her meager supplies, they miraculously never run out. It's a powerful illustration of radical faith, of acting on what you believe even before you see the physical evidence. It's like taking that leap of faith, trusting that the net will appear even when you can't see it yet. Exactly. And the author takes it even further, saying that speaking against a true prophet, well, it's like speaking against the Holy Spirit. Wow. Okay, so we're talking serious implications here. Uh, it's not something to be taken lightly. Not at all. It highlights the weight of how we respond to these individuals who carry a prophetic message. Okay, so all this talk about recognizing true prophets, it makes me think about discernment. The book talks about the prophet Elisha revealing the enemy's plans, which is incredible. But it also makes me wonder, how can we be sure, especially in today's world where there are so many voices, how do we know who to trust? How can we tell if someone is truly speaking for God? Oh, man, that is the million dollar question, isn't it? And I appreciate that the book doesn't pretend there are easy answers. It doesn't give you a checklist, like five easy steps to spot a prophet. Because let's face it, spiritual matters are rarely black and white, are they? You got it. They're complex, full of nuance. So if there's no checklist, no easy formula, how do we navigate that? What helps us figure out if a message is really from God? Well, the book highlights a couple of important things. For one, it emphasizes that a true prophet's message will always point back to God. It'll line up with his word. Makes sense, right? Like, mm. it, it's got to be consistent with what we know about God, about his character, his heart. Exactly. And the other thing, and this is really interesting, the author suggests that a true prophet can actually help you develop your own prophetic gifts. You mean like our own ability to hear from God directly? Exactly. So it's not about just blindly following someone else, but about growing in our own relationship with God, learning to hear his voice for ourselves. I like that. It's about empowering us to discern for ourselves. Absolutely. And that idea of personal growth, it really ties back to the book's main message welcoming a prophet. It isn't about giving up our own responsibility. It's about opening ourselves up to a deeper understanding of God's plan for us. So there's this potential for amazing blessings if we welcome a prophet, but we've also talked about the risks if we reject a true prophet. But are there any other downsides mentioned? I mean, what happens if we miss it, if we reject a genuine prophet? Well, the author is pretty clear about the potential consequences. Remember that line from Jesus we talked about? about a house being left desolate. Yeah, definitely hard to forget that one. Right. And as we said, it's about way more than just a physical building. It speaks to this potential for spiritual emptiness, this lack of God's presence and blessing in our lives. And it's not just about disobedience. It's like missing out on something amazing. 
you're right. The book uses this phrase, blocking the gate for great blessings, yeah. which is uh, pretty powerful imagery. It really is. It's like we're closing the door on the very things we might be praying for. Revival, deliverance, guidance, breakthrough, all of it gone. Like refusing a delivery that has exactly what you ordered. Exactly. And I think that's what makes it so heartbreaking, this sense of missing out on what God wants to do in and through us. It really drives home the cost of rejecting that prophetic voice. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got deliverance, protection, a deeper connection with God, the possibility of stepping into our destinies. What else? Oh, the book also talks about prophets helping us to unlock our potential, right? Yes. The author uses the term dormant destinies. It's like we all have these gifts, this potential within us, but sometimes we need someone to help us see it, to activate it. It's like having a spiritual talent scout in a way, right? Yeah. Someone who can see the greatness in us, even when we can't see it ourselves. Precisely. They help us see ourselves as God sees us, and that can be incredibly powerful. The book talks about David, right? Yeah. The shepherd boy who became a king. Exactly. No one except maybe Samuel, the prophet, looked at young David and saw a future king. But Samuel, through that prophetic anointing, he recognized David's potential, anointed him, and paved the way for his destiny to unfold. That's powerful. It makes you think about what might be possible if we could just shift our perspective. Right. And the book doesn't present this as a passive thing either. It emphasizes our own willingness to receive, to partner with God in seeing those possibilities become our reality. So it's not a one-way street. The prophet might point us in the right direction, but we have to be willing to actually take the journey. I love that. It takes courage, that willingness to step out in faith, to trust God in the unknown. It does. Okay, so we've talked about the blessings, the risks of rejecting a prophet, the importance of discernment. But there's this other layer, something that I find super intriguing. The book seems to suggest that welcoming a prophet isn't just about individual blessings, but about something much bigger, something that impacts the whole community. You're picking up on something really important there. The author uses this phrase, the lost glory, to describe what's missing when we as individuals and as communities fail to recognize and welcome the prophetic. The lost glory. Okay, now you've got my attention. What is that exactly? Well, the author connects it directly to the presence and power of God. It's like when we welcome prophets, we're not just welcoming individuals. We're welcoming that anointing, that insight, the very spirit that rests upon them. It's like opening the windows, letting fresh air into a stuffy room, mm -hmm. you know, bringing light into a dark space. It's about creating space for God to move powerfully. I love that image. It's about inviting that transformative presence of God, allowing him to do what only he can do. Okay, that makes sense. But it kind of begs the question, if this lost glory is so amazing, so life-giving, why do you think some people resist the prophetic? It's like mm -hmm. they say, right? People fear what they don't understand. And maybe for some, this whole idea of prophecy, it just feels a little too, I don't know, out there. I think that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And the author points out that a lot of times, People just think of prophets as fortune tellers predicting the future, but their role, it's so much bigger than that. Totally. Prophets, they can deliver warnings, sure, but also messages of hope. They can offer guidance, direction, even reveal hidden truths about ourselves, about the world. Absolutely. It's about bringing clarity, insight, and sometimes, honestly, those truths, they can be challenging. They can shake things up a bit. Which makes me wonder, if we're being honest, Maybe some of that resistance, it comes down to fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of change, maybe even fear of having our comfortable little worldviews challenged, right? Oh, 100%. As humans, we crave certainty, but the prophetic, it often leads us right into the unknown. The author actually talks about how we get so comfortable in our routines and our belief systems that when a prophet comes along challenging the status quo, it can be really unsettling, even threatening. It's easier to just stay in the dimly lit room, mm -hmm. right? even if we're stumbling around in the dark. At least it's familiar. Exactly. But the book, it challenges us to be brave, to embrace the idea that growth, real transformation, it usually involves a little discomfort. It means stepping outside of what feels safe and easy. It's like... You know how muscles grow stronger when we push past our comfort zones in our workouts? Maybe it's the same with our spirits, you know? I love that analogy because it highlights how we have to be active participants in our spiritual growth. We can't just sit back and wait for enlightenment to hit us over the head, right? Right. We got to be proactive, put in the work. Exactly. We have to be intentional about seeking growth, even if it means embracing a little discomfort. So we've talked about fear of the unknown, discomfort with change. But what about pride? 
Could that also be a factor in why some might resist the prophetic? Oh, absolutely. Pride can be a huge stumbling block. The author suggests that sometimes our own egos are need to be right. It can prevent us from being open to receiving a word, especially if it goes against what we already think or want to hear. Like, who are you to tell me this? Even if it's coming from a place of love, even if it's actually a message from God. Exactly. We get so attached to our own limited understanding that we miss what God is trying to show us. But the book, it encourages us to come to the prophetic with humility, to remember that God can speak through anyone, regardless of their background, their position, or even how we personally feel about them. It's about quieting our own egos long enough to hear God's voice, mm -hmm. right? however it comes to us, as unexpected as it might be. Yes. And at the end of the day, that's what welcoming a prophet is all about. It's about creating space for God to work in and through us, both individually and as a community. So it's not about blindly following, but about being open to hearing and responding to God's voice, no matter how he chooses to speak to us. Exactly. And when we do that, when we embrace the prophetic, the book suggests that we start to experience the fullness of God's blessings. We tap into that lost glory we were talking about, that tangible presence of God transforming our lives, our communities. That's a powerful image. I, it makes me think about this other point the book makes about how the prophetic, it's not just limited to a select few individuals. It's something we can all tap into. Oh, that's right. He talks about that. It's not just about recognizing external prophetic voices, but also about cultivating that inner space where we can hear from God directly. Right. It's like the lost glory isn't just out there somewhere. It's also within us waiting to be awakened. That's a powerful thought to end on. What would it look like for us to become more tuned in to God's voice, more sensitive to his leading in our lives, what if we all embraced our potential to be messengers of hope, of truth, of transformation? Those are some big questions. And honestly, this whole conversation has left me feeling challenged, but also really inspired. Challenged to look at my own life, my own willingness to embrace the prophetic, but also inspired by the possibilities. But, but what could happen if we as individuals and communities really opened ourselves up to God's work in us? Beautifully said. It's about stepping into that adventure of faith. Trusting that as we seek him, as we listen for his voice, he will meet us in extraordinary ways, unlocking that lost glory within us and in the world around us. Well, that's all the time we have for today's deep dive. We hope this conversation has stirred something in you, a desire to explore the prophetic, to listen more closely to God's voice, and to embrace the incredible adventure of faith. <laughs> Until next time, keep seeking, keep listening, and keep diving deep.